hello. We're going to talk today about the endocrine system. And uh, so um, that's chapter seven <clears throat> for this section. Um, and we're going to go through, we're going to go through these things. We're going to talk about hormones and the categories. And then we're going to talk a little bit about feedback. And then we're going to go through some specific hormones and their functions. And those are things that you'll have to, you'll have to learn. But in general, uh, I would say that from now on, we're going to come across hormones on a regular basis because hormones are uh, integral to a lot of different systems in the cardiovascular system. Uh, of course, the brain has a lot of hormones and then reproduction when we talk about that, when we talk about digestion, uh, we're going to uh, we're going to come back and talk a lot about these. So uh, right now we're just mainly interested in trying to understand the endocrine system as a system. Uh, and then some of these that are specifically endocrine types of, uh, of glands. Um, if for instance, uh, I have a list here, um, the hypothalamus, we'll talk more about that, and the pituitary gland. We've often heard the pituitary gland is the master gland because it releases so many uh, what we call tropic hormones, which then activate other glands. There's the thyroid gland and the thymus. And sitting here, you can see barely maybe these little dots these are uh, parathyroid glands that actually sit on the thyroid gland. Uh, and then we have the pancreas, where well, the pancreas is mostly exocrine, and we'll talk about what that means, uh, but it does have an endocrine role as well. Uh, the adrenal gland, which sits like a little hat right there on top of the kidneys, um, and of course it releases adrenaline or epinephrine and norepinephrine. And then we have the gonads, the ovaries and the testes. Okay, so uh, one of the questions that always comes up on, on exams, quizzes, whatever, uh, is what do hormones do? Um, we, we've, everybody's heard the word hormones. We talk about, well, you know, hormones are out of balance. Uh, but they do a ton of things. They have, they have a, a lot of control. That's why they're such an this is such an interesting section, uh, or hormones are such interesting molecules. Uh, but they can re control the rates of enzymatic reaction. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of different things because enzymatic reactions are the functions of your cells. So when we think about people, you know, with... Uh, with uh, hyperthyroidism or something like that, that might mean that their glycolysis is, is taking place faster, the Krebs cycle, those types of things, those types of metabolic processes are actually taking faster, taking place faster. Um, transport of ions or molecules across a cell membrane. Well, sometimes uh, you can have a cell that actually increases or decreases how much, let's say, uh, sodium or potassium or calcium or something like that that it's taking into or letting out of the cell. And you may need to change that um, on, a, on a very quick basis. Uh, for instance, there are hormones that control how much hydrogen uh, is being put into the stomach. It's The hormone is not uh, necessarily something that's going to control behavior all the time, although that's the way we most think about it. Um, but it's but it's just a, the, the thing that remember with hormones is it's just a way of communicating uh, to the entire body about something that's going on or something that's a little bit further downstream. So um, so we may have uh, we may want to have an effect on in the case of uh, like the parathyroid gland uh, that has to do with calcium levels in the blood. Uh, and so you know, it has to somehow get the signal to all the bones saying that the blood calcium levels are low, so we need to take calcium away from the bone and move it into the blood. Okay, so transport of ions or molecules across cell membranes. Uh, gene expression and protein synthesis. Okay, well, that's a big one because that's what happens during puberty. That's why, you know, people take testosterone uh, to build muscle because it does. It, it releases... Uh, when you when testosterone is released from from the testes, uh, it it sends a signal and it says to uh, increase cell division or not cell division but increase uh, uh, trophic tr hypertrophy uh, to build muscles to make muscles larger uh, and so that is one of the things that it does it does a lot of other things as well but that's usually the uh, the goal of people who are abusing. Uh, testosterone. <clears throat> okay, but but there are lots of examples that are much more benign than that one. Okay, so um, so what are we talking about? Hormones. They're cell to cell communication molecules. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about communication. 
Okay, so we're talking about molecules that have the capability of communicating a signal just about anywhere in their body. Now, some, some like um, there is a hormone that's produced by the heart. It's called atrionatriuretic peptide that has its effect on the kidney. Well, it's released everywhere because one of the big tenets or the important things to know about hormones is that they are transported by the blood, which means that the hormones go everywhere. Now, in the case of the example that I just gave of this A&P, that, uh, that stands for atrial natriuretic peptide, that's produced by the heart, the only place there are receptors for it are the kidneys. So even though it's going everywhere, it's only having its effect in the kidneys. Okay, and so that's another that's another important thing um, is that is that the target is only where there are receptors for the hormone, even though they're going everywhere. Um, so they're chemical signals. They're secreted by a cell or a group of cells. Now we have a lot of we're looking here at a lot of different uh, endocrine glands. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those are the only places that hormones are produced. Uh, hormones, like I just said, can be produced, and it shows a heart here, but it can be produced by the heart. They can be produced by the stomach, even though the stomach isn't, a, isn't a, an endocrine gland uh, by itself. It has another purpose, but it does produce, it does have a little small set of cells that are, are in here that are producing these chemicals and they're communicating and they're communicating to other parts of the digestive system they might be communicating here to the brain they might be sending signals back and then and then other hormones may be produced to activate the uh, digestive system so it's a great little system for uh, the endocrine system is for for communicating kind of keeping everything together uh, the targets tissues are uh, tend to be distant um, they can be close, like like I said, like in the stomach, there are some hormones that have an effect just, just in cells that are very nearby, uh, but it's different than paracrine uh, and autocrine signals that, that are very specifically for uh, molecules that are close by. Uh, hormones have the capability of communicating in distant areas, okay? Uh, activates physiological response at a low, at a low concentrations, okay? So, um, so it doesn't take much of a hormone. You release, you release these hormones and then they go out and they can have an effect in, in lots of areas far away, uh, without a low, without a, uh, a lot of them to be there. Now that was one of the, uh, the reasons this even exists as a, uh, as a definition is because they were trying to figure out, well, what's the difference between a hormone and let's say something like a cytokine or something like that. And, uh, so they had to come up with a number of rules and one of those rules was that hormones they have a response even though it's a low concentration okay um so we have uh, this endocrine reflex pathway well what a reflex is is something that kind of happens automatically uh, and so you have you have information coming from a certain area and then going out to a different area where it's processed and then you have information going back or to a different place okay so you need a stimulus and a sensor now the stimulus uh, can be let's say high blood glucose or something um, and if you have high blood glucose then you need to have a sensor something has to be detecting that the blood glucose levels are high um, and so that sensor uh, so in this case, it's just it's just a cell uh, that's saying high blood glucose. So so glucose is high, and it and then that will have to somehow uh, integrate. That signal will have to be integrated. Now a lot of times these signals will come from uh, go to the brain, for instance, uh, if uh, water levels or, or salt levels are high or low, or there are lots of different examples. Um, and uh, those will have to go to the brain and usually the brain is the integration center okay so that's where this information goes and then it's processed and the brain is obviously not a, a conscious decision uh, but the brain will get that information and then the brain will send out a signal which is the output and it will say okay we need to release a hormone or a hormone needs to be released from somewhere. Now, I just gave the example of glucose. Glucose is kind of handy because there are these little things called beta cells that are in the uh, in the pancreas and they will detect 
the glucose levels of, are high, so they'll see all this glucose. So they have little receptors, and when they're repeatedly activated, the cell itself works as the integration center, and then it will start to release insulin. Okay, uh, but usually, usually for most responses, we see this taking place in the brain for uh, reproduction and those types of things. Usually, it goes up to the brain this, to to be integrated, and then there's the output, and then the target. Okay, so. Uh, if we keep using this insulin as a uh, as an example, the insulin is released. We'll say these are insulin molecules released into the blood. They go everywhere, um, and but they only have an effect on cells that have a receptor for them. Okay. Okay. So a cell that does not have a receptor, they just go right on past. Okay. But a cell that has a receptor, they'll bind to that receptor, and then they'll have a response, okay? And now afterwards, there's a some kind of feedback. It's almost always negative feedback. Now we're going to be talking about how sometimes uh, it's positive feedback, but usually once the hormone has been released and it has its effect, then it will feedback and it will say, okay, in this case it's very automatic, blood glucose levels fall, and then the blood glucose goes away and this cell will stop producing the insulin, okay? So that's a feedback system. I mean, if, if it comes to a thyroid hormone, where the brain might uh, say we need to produce thyroid hormone, and, uh, and then that's produced, and then that will feed back saying, yes, we are making thyroid hormone, and then that signal will stop, and you'll stop making thyroid hormone, or at least it'll slow. Okay, all right. So that's that's the negative feedback, and we talked about what negative feedback means. There are some examples we'll see later on that are very interesting, where there's actually positive feedback. We mentioned that with uh, with pregnancy and the re release of oxytocin. Well, oxytocin is a hormone. Uh, oxytocin released from the posterior pituitary gland, and it will it it has that effect on uh, childbirth, letdown reflex, and that kind of thing. Um, uh, but we'll talk about that for completely when we talk the when we talk about reproduction and we'll we'll get into the details of that okay so remember this right here uh, the cellular mechanism of action it depends on the binding to the target cell receptors as I said some hormones will go into and out of a cell and if there's no receptor they don't bind meanwhile if you have a cell that has a receptor it'll move in and it'll bind or it might bind on the surface okay it depends on what kind of a uh, hormone it is and we'll talk about those too actually right now. So remember I said that hormones are just molecules and by now a lot of these things should start looking familiar. Peptides, okay we keep hearing about peptides and proteins, all right? Steroids, okay? We've heard steroids developed from cholesterol, okay? So hopefully that sounds familiar. Well we know cholesterol, we talked about that when we were talking about the cell membrane. Uh, amino acids, we know what amino acids are. Uh, and so one of the things to start paying attention to is this repetition. It's like here we are with peptides. We've talked about peptides. We've talked about proteins. We kind of know how they were made um, or how we make proteins. Um, but the body only has a certain number of things that it's capable of doing. And so you start hearing the same things over and over again. Um, and so in a way that's good, but in a way it, it's not uh, because because you know, it's you, you start to get confused about, okay, you know, peptides, I thought peptides were this thing, or I thought proteins were this, uh, but proteins have a lot of different roles, and, and the same with uh, with cholesterol. Cholesterol does many different things. Amino acids have, have countless roles. Uh, so we're talking about how these particular molecules come together to make a signaling molecule that is released into the blood and has an effect somewhere else. So we're going to go through each one of these individually, the peptides, the steroids, and the amino acid derived hormones. Okay, so first of all, if we start with uh, peptide hormones, remember a peptide is a chain of amino acids. That's all it is. Okay, a peptide, we call it a peptide because it's a short chain. Um, a protein, we usually say that it's a it's a long chain, usually over a hundred uh, amino acids. Okay, so so the difference between a peptide and a protein is pretty um, pretty vague, uh, but it really just comes down to if it's really long, we call it a protein. If it's short, we call it a peptide. Okay, which means that it had to go through this process of being coded by the DNA. 
Okay, and then you had, remember, transcription, and then translation, which is what's going on here, and then there is your protein. This is your protein right here. Okay, so that's the protein coming out. Um, but, but it comes out, and it's not an active protein. I mean, this, this thing is not an active protein. It's got this little molecule here, there, this little part here, uh, which is a signal saying where it's supposed to be built, so we need to cut that off. Okay, so now now we have this modification. We've talked about some of the modifications that happen in the uh, in the endoplasmic reticulum. That's what this is. This is the ER, and uh, and so the we call this before when it's first when it's first made and it's not active. We call that a pre pre pro hormone, and then after some modifications have taken place, we call it a pro hormone. But it's still not active. Okay, so this still can't function. As a, pro, as, a, uh, as a hormone. And so it moves from the ER, it moves down into the Golgi because it's going to be excreted. So it makes sense to, it, that it has to run through the Golgi and then packaged into a vesicle. Okay, so that's what we see here. We see it being packaged into a vesicle. And then you have those final actions, that final modification that makes it an active hormone, okay? And then it's released, and it can be released as an active hormone. Now, this hormone looks like it's just moving right through, okay? Well, it's moving into the blood, so this is the extracellular fluid. So it has to move through the extracellular fluid. It moves into the blood, and then it can go, and it can have its effect wherever there's a receptor for it, okay? All right, so um, if we if we say that that was insulin, so insulin is a peptide hormone. So if we if we can sort of imagine that this is the process that insulin goes through uh, to be produced, um, insulin is a hormone that's about 110 amino acids in length. We still call it a peptide. It's 110. Like I said, it's uh, pretty vague about what what counts as a as a peptide versus a protein. But it's short. It's a pretty small protein or peptide. And uh, you can see that here's pro-insulin, and it has this little thing on it here. Well, that little thing is really not part of an active insulin molecule, okay? And so that has to be cleaved off or cut off. And so that's this process, this modification process. And once you cut that off, so it's separated now, and it's not active. Okay. It exists, and actually when you uh, check to see if someone is producing pep, uh, insulin, this might be one of the things you look at, because if they're making insulin, this little guy is also in the blood, and so you can actually just check for that uh, to see if they're producing insulin. And so this is the active, protein, or the active hormone, okay, which is also a peptide or a protein, uh, but this is this is the active hormone. This is insulin, and then that insulin can be released into the blood, and uh, and we and and it has its effect. Okay, so if we if we back up and we look, remember um, because insulin insulin is actually pretty important, especially if you're going into anything medical, uh, because of a lot of type one and type two diabetes. Here we see type one diabetes. Um, well, insulin is being produced in these little cells. It's called the islets of Langerhans, uh, but they're but they're called beta cells. Okay, so beta cells, and beta cells, their job is to produce insulin. So, so if we if we pretend we blow up, you know, part of one of these. Uh, these little islets here, and we could see that there are a bunch of beta cells, and these beta cells are excreting insulin, and that insulin will move through the extracellular fluid into the blood where it's whisked away and it has its effects, <clears throat> which we'll talk about next. Now, remember, 99% of the pancreas is exocrine, and we'll talk about what what the uh, what the what the pancreas does, uh, but it's really involved in uh, producing digestive enzymes uh, and squirting them right into the small intestine. But it does have this very small little function that's obviously very important, where it produces insulin as well. Okay, so insulin release of insulin from beta cells is a result of high glucose levels. And it's inhibited by a release of stress hormones. Okay, so uh, a lot of interplay, a lot of sensing going on of what's going on. Um, um, and then there's another molecule called glucagon, except glucagon, it also exists in there, except it's being released from something called alpha cells. So alpha cells release glucagon. So 
in a sense, when your blood glucose levels get high or are increased, then we release insulin and insulin will lower them. Okay, so that's negative feedback. When your glucose levels get low, like between meals, long time between meals, then you release glucagon from alpha cells, also in the pancreas, and your glucose levels go up again, also negative feedback. Okay, so uh, in type 1 diabetes, this is kind of important for people to know, in type 1 diabetes, your immune system destroys your own beta cells. So it will actually wipe out these beta cells so you can't produce insulin. So there is no insulin. That's much different than type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes because in type 2 diabetes you're still producing insulin. So what does insulin do exactly? Well, it does a number of things. Now, if we if we think about how we're really trying to figure out how the endocrine system works in general. And we just saw a way that a hormone was produced, the cell from which it was produced, and now we are saying, okay, now it has to have an effect. Well, we said for it to have an effect, it had to have a receptor. Okay, And adipose, so fat cells, liver cells, muscle cells, these all have receptors for insulin. So the insulin is going around and there's a receptor. It binds to the receptor and then it can cause all of these things to happen. So uh, glucose just starts being used inside the cell. But one of the really important things that binding of insulin, so when this insulin binds to the receptor, it causes a glucose transporter to move to the cell membrane. So this glucose transporter may have been sitting down here, minding its own business, and then when the insulin bound, this glucose transporter moved up, inserted itself into the membrane, and so now glucose can leave the bloodstream and go into the cell. Okay. And then once it's in the cell, it can go through gly glycolysis, or it can form glycogen. It can, it can uh, go through glycolysis. It can produce fatty acids. The glucose will be used up or stored, as in the case of glycogen and fats. Um, so it goes away. So this glucose is being taken up. And then, uh, of course, if you have a lot of glucose, if you eat a lot of Oreos, um, it can only store so much glycogen, it starts to store its fatty acids. If you're active, then it will go through glycolysis to make ATP. Okay, so in type 2 diabetes, in type 2 diabetes, the insulin is made, the insulin binds to the receptor, but this doesn't happen. Your glucose transporter never makes it, okay, or not very many do. It's, 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 it interferes with uh, the glucose transporter going up there to remove that insulin and so or that glucose and so the uh, so you tend to uh, so the glucose levels build up in the blood because you're not able to uh, release them okay so um, all right, so that was that was an example of a peptide hormone now there are steroid hormones now steroid hormones are all made from cholesterol okay um, if you look at the structure of cholesterol, remember we talked about cholesterol as being part of the cell membrane and it gave some stability to the cell membrane. But if you look at the structure of cholesterol and then you look at the structure of these, here's cortisol, that's the stress hormone. See how similar it looks to cholesterol? And there's aldosterone. We'll talk about aldosterone when we talk about the kidneys, but that has to do with, that actually helps control blood pressure. Testosterone, estrogens, okay, so estradiol here very similar in structure to cholesterol because they're made from from cholesterol and they have very they look very similar to each other too there aren't very many differences there's a little difference here uh, and uh, and let's see this isn't a very good molecule here there's a little bit of a difference uh, between these two but they're very between the testosterone and the estrogen uh, but they're very uh, they're very similar because they're all made from cholesterol now the thing about cholesterol remember it's lipophilic that means it can cross over through it can cross through the uh, cell membrane and uh, so that means that it can bind carriers uh, 
uh, or it has a it has a carrier, but it can bind either in the cytoplasm or it can bind to receptors in the nucleus. Uh, so that's that's something that's uh, that's interesting about uh, about steroid hormones is that they are they're lipophilic and so they cross the membrane. Uh, but in, because they're lipophilic, to, in order to stay in the blood, they have to actually be carried on a different molecule. Usually, a protein carrier will bind to the uh, the uh, hormone, steroid hormone, and it will then carry it through and then uh, it will it will come off once it finds the receptor. Okay, um, so usually steroid receptors have a, a genomic effect. They usually have a, a long-lasting effect to repress genes for protein synthesis, and they're slower, so they, they have a much slower function. Uh, meanwhile, we, we talked about uh, the peptide we talked about insulin. Insulin has a reasonably fast uh, effect, not not maybe as fast as uh, some other hormones, but it's reasonably fast. But cholesterol derived or steroid hormones tend to be slow. Okay. Um, all right. So sometimes they do have cell membrane receptors occasionally. So we just said that they can. This is a cell. Steroids can usually go right into the cell. They can even go right into the nucleus. But sometimes there's a receptor for them, and they'll actually just bind to the receptor. But either way, they're having one of these effects uh, to activate or repress genes. Uh, they're doing something that's long-term, more long-lasting, and uh, and has a slower has a slower response. Okay. So just one more look at this. Uh, if we look at cholesterol here's cholesterol and this is the path so this is the starting molecule and then you look at the path and there are a lot of different things being made progesterone uh, corticosterone which is a uh, which is involved in stress aldosterone which we'll talk about later but here's cortisol and this is what's interesting is that really men and women make both testosterone and estrogens okay and really, the only difference is having this one enzyme that actually turns testosterone into estradiol, which is an estrogen. This is another estrogen here. These are both estrogens. And so if you have this enzyme, this thing called aromatase, then you will go from having androstenedione, which is a uh, which is considered a, a a precursor or often often a, a male hormone and testosterone which is considered a male hormone but these have to be made to make the estrogens okay and so it just depends on how much aromatase you have uh, as to as to how much of this uh, hormone is being produced okay all right so um, this is what we were just saying so I won't spend too much time this is the carrier that we had talked about okay so the hormone has to have a protein carrier because it's lipophilic it's not soluble in water and then when it gets close there are signals that will say okay break off and then it will come into the cell so this is the cell membrane here it will cross the cell membrane and it can bind to a receptor inside in the cytosol or it can all the way go all the way into the nucleus and bind to what's called a, a nuclear receptor and again like I said sometimes uh, hormones will also bind to the uh, to the surface to a uh, surface receptor okay so the last one that we're going to talk about is the uh, amino acid derived okay so again amino acids uh, we've already talked about um, amino acids in terms of their use in making proteins, and we'll also talk about amino acids as to to make things like uh, uh, neurotransmitters, like here's serotonin, isn't for example. But if we look, and of course you don't have to know all these structures, but here's tryptophan. Tryptophan is is one of the 20 amino acids that come together. To make so there are 20 different amino acids that can be used to make a protein they just all come together in a different order and tryptophan is one of these and you can see that there's a molecule called melatonin that's made from tryptophan and if you've ever uh, you know heard about like at Thanksgiving oh turkey has a lot of tryptophan and that's what makes us tired well this is where that comes from is because melatonin is made from tryptophan the trouble is a lot of things have a lot of tryptophan because because it's part of a protein okay uh, or it's part of a lot of different proteins and so beef has tryptophan a lot of different proteins have tryptophan uh, but it's just how much it is and so the the logic is that if you if you have tryptophan 
in your diet that you're going to be more inclined to make more melatonin because part of the pathway, this is the tryptophan molecule here, this is the amino acid, and it just goes through a few enzymatic changes to finally end up making melatonin. Okay, so melatonin, so um, most hormones that we'll talk about, actually most hormones are actually made from tyrosine. Tryptoph melatonin is really the only example, and that's why I'm talking about it. It's really the only uh, example of one that is made from tryptophan. Okay, so you can see serotonin is part of this pathway on its way to make melatonin. Uh, so melatonin is made from tryptophan. It's released from the pineal gland. Okay. And the pineal gland sits in the brain, about in the middle of the brain, near a region called the thalamus, and it it increases. So so you don't make a lot of melatonin most of the time, so it's kind of down here at a fairly low level. And then when it starts to get dark, the production of melatonin increases. Okay, So it increases, and then when you wake up, the melatonin levels start to decrease. So it is. It's involved in... The circadian cycle. Okay, so this is a, this is a good example of one that it's just an amino acid that the body has taken advantage of, and it said, "Okay, tryptophan. Tryptophan's, you know, it's in all these proteins. Let's use it for something." And so it uses it for this uh, for this melatonin for the circadian pathway, this circadian rhythm by releasing melatonin from the pineal gland. Okay, so here, this sentence right here, most amine hormones are derived from tyrosine, okay? So, and one of the most important, and one that you'll have to know the pathway of, uh, is thyroid hormones, okay? So we're gonna talk a lot about thyroid hormones. Now, um, and we'll come back to that and discuss it in detail, but also there's something called catecholamines, which we'll come back and we'll see that when we talk about the, uh, the nervous system too, uh, but dopamine, norepinephrine, and then epinephrine, which acts as a hormone released from the adrenal gland, um, these are also just ultimately made from tyrosine. And you look at the structure of tyrosine, and then you look at the structure of all of these, they're all very similar, and yet they're very different. They all have very different uh, functions. And this is, the thyroid hormone is basically just this. If you look at this structure and then you compare it with this part of the structure, you can see that they're very similar, almost identical, uh, but this has the extra ring put on it. So another ring gets stuck on there, and that's what makes thyroid hormone. So that's what's having the effect. When your thyroid gland is activated, you're releasing something called T3 and T4. The, the, well, this would be T4 because it has one, two, three, four iodines. Thyroid hormone, four, okay? It has, of course, it has the the, uh, this name, but it's the thyroid hormone and it has four iodines. Um, this one has three, so it's called T3. Okay, all right, so we'll say we'll talk more about thyroid hormones in a minute. Okay, neurohormones. So um, sometimes neurotransmitters or uh, neurons will release a neurotransmitter directly into the blood. Okay, but it's not a neurotransmitter because neurotransmitters communicate from one neuron to another. So when a neuron releases something directly into the blood, we call it a neurohormone. Okay, so it's hormones released from neurons uh, into the blood. Okay, because because that's what a hormone is. It's a, it's a signaling molecule released into the blood. Okay, so the adrenal medulla, which is the uh, inner part of the adrenal gland, which like I said, sits right on top of the kidneys, uh, it produces epinephrine, okay? Epinephrine, another name for epinephrine, is adrenaline, okay? So it makes sense that it's being made by the adrenal gland, okay? That's why they're named that way. Uh, and so that's an example of a neurohormone. Epinephrine is being made, and if we, and if we look here, it's, these are, these are neurotransmitters, dopamine and norepinephrine, uh, and here's epinephrine that's just one step away. So it makes sense that neurons would already know how to make it, and so the adrenal gland uh, is just using that. Uh, the hypothalamus, we're going to talk a lot about the hypothalamus because that's an important part of uh, the endocrine system, but that's actually a brain region. Okay, so 
if we're talking about neurohormones and we're talking about releasing molecules from a neuron, well, it kind of makes sense that if you have a brain that a neuron is going to be the one releasing the signal. Okay, and so that's, uh, and we'll come back to that and we'll talk about that. And usually the hypothalamus releases that signal to the pituitary. The hypothalamus releases it to the pituitary gland. Oops. Uh, and then there's a posterior and an anterior that we'll talk about now. So, um, now, this is, this is the thing you have to really remember. The posterior pituitary, if you read this right here, it says the posterior pituitary is an extension of neural tissue. Here's the hypothalamus up here. Definitely a brain region. But there are neurons that pass from the hypothalamus down into the posterior pituitary. Okay? And I'll tell you right now, this is not, it's not that hard to remember the, in, the hormones of the posterior pituitary and the anterior because there are only two. Okay? And it's oxytocin and vasopressin. And we'll see that in another slide here too, but uh, this will help you remember it maybe. There are only two, oxytocin and vasopressin. And so they're released directly from neurons into, because they're hormones, into blood. Okay? Um, so remember this, the hypothalamus, because the reason, the reason this matters is because you can think of a stressful thought or you can think about something you uh you can hear if you're if you're a nursing mother you can hear a baby cry and you will actually have a hormonal physiological effect so the brain is very powerful the brain can in many ways decide uh that it's going to have an effect and it's going to release this and so uh so that's a great brain uh, periphery interface is this hypothalamus and leading to the pituitary gland. Uh, that's a great way for the brain to communicate with the rest of the body. Okay, so if we if we get into a little more detail about that, um, so here's the posterior pituitary again, and this is showing the neurons here. This is showing the neuron that's making one of these two, either oxytocin or vasopressin. They're very similar molecule. They each have nine amino acids. They're in a little bit di different order. Um, you can see down here is really the only difference. This, this ring, there's an isoleucine instead of a phenylalanine. That's a difference. Uh, and then you see here an arginine and a leucine that are different here. Those are the only differences between vasopressin and oxytocin, and yet they're very different, and they have, they're very different molecules, and they have very different effects, okay? So, uh, but those are the only ones, aldosterone and oxytocin, posterior pituitary, and they're neurohormones, because this is uh, nervous tissue. So hopefully, hopefully you can keep that, keep that straight. We're not going to talk too much about the effects of those right now. We'll definitely talk about it when we cover those systems though. Okay, so the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is legitimately endocrine tissue. These are not neurons that are going down into the anterior pituitary. This is what's called a portal system or a network of blood vessels or uh, capillaries. Okay, so we call that a portal system. Uh, but here's the hypothalamus up here with its neurons because this is brain tissue for sure. And it just releases it into blood up here. And then the blood carries it down to the cells, other cells of the pituitary. Now, you may be predicting what's going on. The hypothalamus is releasing something, okay? And then it's telling the pituitary gland to release something, because that's what these cells are going to do. These are endocrine cells. That means that they're producing hormones that they're going to release. So we kind of have this two-step process. We have the process of the brain saying, hey, let's go, and then releasing a signal, and then the hypothalamus or the uh, pituitary gland saying, okay, we're going to start releasing uh, whatever this hormone is. And now this, there can be a big variety of different uh, cells endocrine cells that are producing a variety of hormones. Uh, here you can see prolactin, growth hormone, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenal corticotropin hormone involved in stress, um, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone. These we'll talk a lot about during uh, reproduction. 
and uh, the thyroid gland we're going to talk about later uh, in this in this little session okay all right so hopefully we have that we understand that the anterior pituitary is endocrine tissue and it releases a variety and um, this isn't even all of the uh, all of the hormones that are released from the anterior pituitary but we saw all that were released from the posterior okay all right so let's talk about how this control takes place we just mentioned that the the hypothalamus releases a hormone and then tells the pituitary to release a hormone we call these so a hormone that is released to tell another hormone to be released I hope that makes sense we call those tropic hormones okay so a tropic hormone controls the secretion of another hormone so um, We'll, we'll use the example of thyroid hormone in a second, um, but but that's uh, but that's the feedback. So here's the hypothalamus, and in this case, it's uh, it's uh, releasing cortisol releasing hormone or corticotropin releasing hormone, and then acetylcorticotropin hormone is released from the pituitary. And you don't have to remember these, uh, but that's what's happened. The hypothalamus released a hormone, a tropic hormone, which caused the pituitary to release a tropic hormone which this hormone went down all over the body but there are receptors for it on the in the adrenal cortex that tells it to release cortisol and that's the hormone this is the active hormone here this is the one that's actually going to get a response it's going to do something these were tropic hormones hey you tell tell the uh, the adrenal gland to release cortisol and so this one went down the to the uh, adrenal gland and said hey adrenal gland release cortisol and then it released cortisol okay so we call these first two tropic hormones okay um, so this pathway is repeated over and over like I said there are a lot of different um, hormones uh, that are that are released by the pituitary and so we call it the hypothalamic for hypo hypothalamus hypophysial which refers to the uh, the uh, pituitary gland portal system and it's a portal system because uh, like we saw here it's got this network of of blood vessels okay so that's what it's called and a lot of times we'll say hypothalamic um, pituitary uh, in this case adrenal so we would call that HPA and we would call that an HPA axis or something like that or if it's going to from the hypothalamus to the pituitary to the gonads we would call that HPG if it's going from the hypothalamus to the pituitary to the thyroid we would we could call that HPT etc that kind of thing okay and we call that an axis because that's where it's going okay um, so anterior pituitary stimulation from hypothalamus tropic hormones uh, endocrine gland stimulation from anterior pituitary uh, tropic hormones so endocrine gland uh, the endocrine gland is the ult ultimately the one that uh, that is uh, affected and that's where the actual uh, hormone is released the active hormone is released okay so let's this is one that you are going to have to learn okay so I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna go through this and uh, we have the brain whatever the stimulus was okay so there can be a lot of things that stimulate uh, uh, thyroid hormone to be produced it's usually something metabolic you have your low on something and so it will stimulate the the uh, thyroid gland production or thyroid production thyroid hormone production okay so here's the hypothalamus remember that's in the brain okay uh, and and it releases something called thyrotropin releasing hormone or TRH so this is releasing here TRH okay so that's a trophic hormone um, and then the TRH so that has its effect on the anterior pituitary okay and then the anterior pituitary releases something called thyroid stimulating hormone okay and then that will go and have its effect on the target tissue and that or wait I'm sorry that 
will have its effect, I skipped a step there, will have its effect on the endocrine gland. So this guy needs to be moved up. So, uh, oh, I guess it's pointing to the hormone. So this is the thyroid, keep it all straight here. This is the thyroid gland. So that's the endocrine gland. And then the thyroid gland is the one that releases the T3 and T4, the, that's the actual hormone. And then those hormones will go off and they'll have their effect on whatever the target tissue is. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. The trophic hormones and then you have the, uh, the actual endocrine gland. So um, there's, there's something about, there's something also important about uh, the thyroid gland that you have to under, you have to, have to, have to understand. Now, this T3 and T4, remember earlier we were talking, they were a couple of ring structures, and then they had some other stuff here um, that, uh, that bound to uh, iodine. Okay, so we'll just we'll just draw it simple like this. We'll just say that here's one T3 has to have three iodines on it, and T4 has to have four iodines on it. Okay, so the question is, oops, what if you don't have enough iodine in your blood? Well, what tends to happen is that there's supposed to be a feedback mechanism. So we've we've kind of haven't looked at this yet, but once the hormone is produced, the hormone will go back and say, hey, I have produced my thyroid hormone. You can stop. Okay, so if everything's working properly, once the hormone, the T3 and T4, are produced, they go back and they shut down these guys and they say, okay, we did our job. Okay, now if things aren't working right, if you don't have enough iodine, what tends to happen is you have these, these precursor molecules that are just sitting there being made because the signal's still going, hey, we need thyroid, hey, we need thyroid hormone, more thyroid hormone. So it keeps sending the signal, these trophic hormones, keeps sending the signal down saying, hey, we need more thyroid hormone. But the thyroid gland is down here saying, you know what, we need more iodine. But that doesn't matter because it's not going, this signal isn't going to stop coming down until you start producing the T3 and the T4. Okay. So this precursor, we call that thyroglobulin. Okay, so this this is this is thyroglobulin. I'm oversimplifying a little bit. It's actually part of a big uh, protein complex, but this thyroglobulin is made and it's waiting for iodine to be added to it. If no iodine is there, it builds up, it builds up and up and up and up and up. And what do you think happens to your thyroid gland? Your thyroid gland goes from being this big to being this big as it fills up with this precursor molecule and we call that a goiter. Okay. Okay, so that's what a goiter is. So a goiter is a buildup of the thyroglobulin, this precursor molecule. And uh, and it's just waiting for the iodine. So if your blood levels of iodine are low, in fact I uh, I knew somebody just recently that uh, decided to eat healthier and uh, one of the things they did is they cut out everything that was that was not natural. And one of those natural things that they cut out was uh, was salt. Uh, they stopped eating salt. Well, salt, that's why we have iodized salt, um, is because that's a source of iodine. So if you cut out salt, uh, a lot of times, unless you get your iodine from a supplement, which this person eventually did when they started to develop a goiter, uh, that's if you if you don't get your iodine from your diet, that's that's a... Uh, uh, iodized salt is a uh, is a resource for that. Okay, so again, uh, because this is one of those this is one of those that you have to know. I'm going to ask questions about it on the test. Um, I might have you explain it on one of the essay questions. Uh, you have to understand the sequence sequence because I want to just have one example that, to make sure that you understand this hypothalamic, pituitary, and then gland axis. So uh, in this case, it would be HPT. So uh, the hypothalamus releases thyroid, thyroid releasing hormone 
that activates the pituitary endocrine glands, which then release TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone. The thyroid stimulating hormone activates the thyroid hormone, which will produce T3 and T4, which are the active thyroid hormones. And then those will go off and have an effect on their target cells, wherever they are. Okay. Um, and so, and also be able to explain what the uh, what the goiter what goiter is what causes goiter, and it's because there isn't enough iodine added to the uh, that molecule thyroglobulin. There isn't enough iodine added to that, uh, and so this just builds up, and that's what causes the goiter. Okay, so these these three steps, just remember those. Um, and so, what effect does it have? It has lots of different effects: effects on growth, metabolism. Um, and we can we can see we can see the effects by looking at someone with either hypo where they don't produce enough uh, thyroid hormone or hyper where they produce too much thyroid hormone. Uh, people with hypothyroid uh, hypothyroidism may be a little bit more sluggish. Uh, they usually have trouble controlling their weight, uh, low energy. They have a, their metabolism is a little bit lower. Uh, people with hyperthyroidism may be, uh, you know, they, they may be very, very thin. You know, there's sometimes these people that, you know, are so thin, it looks like their eyes are popping out of their head. Um, and so, um, so that's hyperthyroidism. So we can see the differences, uh, but they have many effects on many different cells. Okay, and this is what I just said. When iodine is low or not present, the precursor thyroglobulin builds up and causes a goiter. Okay, so um, just some endocrine pathologies, uh, sort of stuff that you, you might be able to figure out if you understand how to read this. Hypersecretion means, uh, I shouldn't put a down arrow there, I'm trying to point to it. Hypersecretion means an increase in secretion. So hyper means a lot, or hyper means more or increased. Uh, that means when you have excess. Uh, this can be caused by tumors, um, exogenous, iatrogenic treatment. Now if you don't know what that means, it means you're being treated to death. Uh, so a lot of times you can get treatments and the treatments will actually have an effect on hormone releases and it can, it can cause an increase in, uh, in uh, the release of some hormone or it can cause an alteration in hormone levels. Um, and uh, and there's an, an, an interference with the negative feedback mechanism, like kind of like we saw with the, uh, um, with the goiter, except in that case, in the, in, the case of, in the case of goiter, you actually, it wasn't producing the active uh, hormone. Uh, but if you interfere with this negative feedback, you can actually, in, you just keep making more and more of the active hormone. So we call that hypersecretion. Hyposecretion, hypo means decreased or lowered. Uh, that means you're not making enough, deficient. Uh, caused by decreased synthesis, materials are atrophy. So if you don't have the building blocks to make the hormone in the first place, then you're not going to be able to make it. Uh, atrophy just means that it's wasting away, that the cells are dying, that they're going away. Uh, so that can happen. And then an absence of, of uh, negative feedback. Okay, so, um, all right. So hopefully this all makes sense and uh, um, that covers pretty much everything that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about with uh, endocrine until we actually talk about the individual systems.